One day, God told the prophet Samuel that it was time for a new king and sent him to the house of a man named Jesse. Jesse had seven sons and brought out each of them to meet Samuel. Samuel told Jesse that David, his youngest son, would be the future king of Israel. Shortly after this, an army of the Philistines, Israel's enemy, set up camp on a hill right across the valley from Israel's army. For 40 days in a row, a gigantic Philistine warrior named Goliath would walk down to the valley and mock the Israelites. But one day when David was visiting the army camp, he heard Goliath taunting the Israelites and asked why no one was willing to fight Goliath. After getting King Saul's permission, David went down into the valley and shouted to Goliath, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Goliath and David charged toward one another. David pulled out a stone, put it in a sling, and flung it at the giant. The stone struck Goliath directly in the forehead, and then David killed him with Goliath's own sword. This victory caused David to become so loved and respected that King Saul became very jealous. Saul tried to kill David, but David escaped into the desert. One day, Saul was in a cave and David snuck up on him. But David could not bring himself to kill Saul. When Saul realized what had happened, he made a peace treaty with David, promising he would not kill him. But not long after, Saul became jealous and tried to kill David again. The Philistines attacked the Israelites and killed all three of Saul's sons. When Saul heard the news, he was so upset that he took out his own sword, fell on it, and killed himself. Then, David was named King of Israel. He made plans to build a giant building called a temple as a place to worship God. God said a temple would eventually be built, but by one of David's sons. One of David's descendants would become a king unlike any before, one whose rule would never end. All right, well, good morning, church. Great to see all of you here today. Uh, many of you know that today's message is part of a four-part series, the third of four, that's kind of a combo pack, okay? Messages that are put together, and uh, we're doing two different things at the same time, calling it a people beyond belief. So we'll be talking about the story and the next chapter, which is all about the life of David, and we're going to be talking about the vision that God has given our church, a vision that we call Beyond Belief. So if you're somebody who's new, we're at the midpoint of kind of a vision moment for our church, uh, a two-year vision moment. We're halfway in between, and the idea behind it is that God is inviting us to become a people beyond belief, that when we would uh, uh, move forward in our spiritual journey, it's not just about believing the right things, but it's moving beyond belief to full surrender. And we think that when thousands of people say, I will fully surrender to God, what God will do through that community is simply beyond belief. Now, the vision is kind of unwrapped on three different levels. There's what's happening here in the people that are at our church and in our city and in our world. And we call those, uh, first of all, beyond ourselves. That's the center ring. And that includes things we talked about last week, like we're all going through the story to increase our biblical literacy, and we had the Soul Care Conference yesterday to minister to our hearts, and uh, Harris III's coming in a couple of weeks for us to be able to reach our friends, so that's what's happening in the middle level. And then in the outer ring, we'll talk about this next week, beyond our borders, this is what God's doing through our church on an international level. And just keeping track of all those things, it would take a long time just to be able to report in on what all those are doing. So we're just doing one at a time, and this week is Beyond Our Walls, what God's been doing in our church. And so we're going to start off the message today, do it a little bit different, and start off with an update of what God's been doing through our church in the city. You guys ready for an update? All right, here we go. Uh, Our dream as a church is not to become just a big, healthy church. 
I mean, that's a good dream, and that's a part of what we're all about, but we believe that God has put us in the middle of the city of Omaha strategically because he wants Omaha and Council Bluffs and Blair and Bennington and Bellevue to all hear the good news of Jesus. In fact, we're really aware that there are a half million people within the boundaries of Omaha, Nebraska, who have not yet received the gift of life that Jesus has to offer. And our crazy dream is that every single person, every man, woman, and child would be able to hear the best news ever from somebody who knows them and loves them, a half a million people. Now, one of the things we realize is this can never happen just by one church making this happen. So we'd be be become a part of a group of churches that are planting churches in our city. And uh, one of the churches, or about 14 months ago, one of the churches that we planted is called Providence Church. And it's planted by Jared Cleaver, who used to be our college pastor, and Andrew Rutten, who used to be in our student ministry here. And uh, Providence Church is now rocking it out in the Blackstone District and doing a great job of reaching that demographic. The same month, 14 months ago, Mission Church started uh, in Village One. A village one's an area of the city that we've been investing in for 10 years and helping this most impoverished area of the city to experience and hear the good news of Jesus. And part of that is planting Mission Church that now has two or 300 people worshiping there every single Sunday, transforming one life at a time. And what you may not know is that last month, Mission Church planted a church, Mission Church Village 2, and we got to kind of come alongside them and have the assist and help them to plant that church. So that's three churches in Omaha, Nebraska in the last 14 months. Well, if you were here a few weeks ago, I felt someone almost about to clap there. Just hang on. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we were able to commission Terry and Eric Carpenter right here on this stage. Because God's calling them to plant a church in Kansas City. They're a couple of our staff members, so we've gotten behind them. And they just started their very first core meetings three weeks ago. This is their third Sunday doing that. And eventually this spring, they're going to open up public services uh, for their church to reach Kansas City with the good news of Jesus. Now, when you add all of this together, and actually I did a little calculating this week, when you add together all of the churches that we've planted over the last 12 years and the churches that they've planted, so daughter churches, granddaughter churches, and you see how many people are experiencing Jesus in a Sunday morning worship setting in those churches, there are over 5,000 people worshiping Jesus in churches that we've planted or granddaughter churches. Now you can clap for that one, yeah. Yeah. So it's been a very fun experience, and it's going to take a lot of people reaching the city in order to, to make it happen. Not only that, but we're reaching out beyond our walls in Village One, where there are kids that need Jesus. It's an impoverished area, and these days there's more lighthouses popping up all over. We've got tutoring rates that are up, crime rates that are down, uh, a church that's been planted, and events that are happening every single month to be able to reach out to that community. We're very excited about that. But we're not only asking the question of how do we reach the city that's far from here, we're also asking how do we love our neighbors? Because it's not an accident that God put us at the end of a business park, the Old Mill Business Park, where thousands of people come to work every day. And we've asked how do we love our neighbors, how do we help to be able to reach people that are geographically right next to us? And while there's many people who go to the business park that would never come to a church, it's just too big of a cultural step for them to move into that, we know that there's pain that's happening in people's lives all over the place. That some of them are struggling with anxiety or depression or grief or divorce. And so a few years ago we asked ourselves the question, would it be possible for us to open up a counseling center it's filled with people who love Jesus, but is reaching out to the Old Mill community. Many of you know that the result of that was opening up city care counseling a few years ago. And our dream was that maybe, just maybe, we'd get 8 to 10 counselors that would be in there and would be helping to reach out to the Old Mill Business Park. Well, it keeps on growing, and today there are 23 counselors who are counseling people in the name of Jesus every single day. And in August... They had 90%, they were 90% full, and about half of the people that were coming were people from an unchurched background, getting Christian counseling in the name of Jesus. This is good news, isn't it? 
So we're thrilled about that, but we're also dreaming that, that, that the porch would have a, 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 just a reverberating influence on our city. One of the things that we didn't plan in advance, but God just had for us, and since we're doing Beyond Belief, we said yes to what God would be doing, is that Crown College Omaha said, hey, do you, or Crown College said, hey, do you think we can plant a site in Omaha? Would you like to partner with us? And we're like, hey, we just happen to have a building. Let's do this thing together. So Crown College Omaha came with big dreams. They launched in August, and they launched with 60 students that are preparing for counseling or for ministry, including our 24 residents. It's very fun to see that education happening right here in our backyard. But here's what's even more fun than that. Uh, Jim Raddy, one of our pastors, and I were putting 2 plus 2 together this week, and we kind of realized that there was a scholarship fund, an endowed fund, that was set up 20 years ago that was designed to be able to help people at Christ Community Church who feel called into ministry to go to a Christian and Missionary Alliance college to prepare for ministry and have a scholarship along the way. And we've sent a lot of students over the years based on that scholarship. Well, having Crown College Omaha move here is a game changer in that, in that we can get that education with that scholarship right here in our backyard. So I just want to let you know today, if you're somebody who is a member or child of a member at Christ Community Church, and you sense God is calling you into ministry, there's a scholarship fund that's available that might be able to get you up to 50% off your tuition as you move towards being able to be educated for the ministry that God's called you to. Is that not cool that God set that up? I'm so excited about that. And if you're not on that track, Crown College is offering a free Old Testament course or New Testament course for anybody who just wants to sign up for it. So that's available to us uh, as a church as well. But beyond that, uh, we're going to be launching in a few weeks, actually, a fitness center called Tap Into Fitness. And Tom Petkovich, who's a member of Christ Community, he loves Jesus. He's going to be running this gym with the hopes that we'll be able to reach people in the Old Mill Business Park, and they'll be introduced to the love of Jesus through fitness. There's going to be a coffee shop that will be opening up probably in the next six months or so, uh, also in the porch. And the idea is, if we try and care for people, body, soul, mind, and spirit, there will be people who might come for a cup of coffee, a fitness uh, uh, a seminar, or uh, a little bit of a workout, or a counseling session who would never come into the church, and just maybe that could be the front porch to the church, and eventually we'd be able to see some disciples being made. Isn't that a fun idea? So that's the dream behind what's happening in the porch. Yeah, you can clap for that. But beyond that, we also realize that if you just do the math on a half a million people and you think if there's a great church that's planting churches that are planting churches and reaching the city, how long would it take to make it happen? And the truth is, it wouldn't happen. Our city would not be reached within our lifetime. So we got to partner with other churches that are Bible-teaching, Bible-believing churches. And so we've begun a movement that's called the Within Reach Movement. And we've now had 37 churches that have signed on to say, we want to be a part of that. We want to get serious about reaching the lost. We want to be serious about planting churches. We want to be serious about uh, extending unprecedented compassion on our city. And we want to be serious about leadership development for the next generation. And these churches are working hard to get it done together in partnership. Because we believe when we do things in unity with people who follow Jesus, God's spiritual power will be unleashed on a city. And we can do more together than we could ever do apart. So we're moving in that partnership and trusting that God is going to move in our city. Now, I want to pause at this moment because as I was doing my final prayer and prep this morning, uh, I sensed that God was leading me to uh, invite us to pray. And it was kind of through this lens. It was like God was saying, Mark, you know, you can't accomplish that vision. And your church can't accomplish that vision. And the Within Reach Network can't accomplish that vision. There's really only one who can accomplish that vision. You know who that is? Like, yeah, it's you, Lord. So he said, why don't you tell the church that and then take a little bit of time to pray and ask me to do the work that I've invited you to join me in on. So we're going to take a minute and pray right in the middle of the message here. And I'm going to go ahead and get on my knees and pray. And I want to invite you to pray with me. If you want to get on your knees and just say, God, we want to ask you to be reaching this city with the good news, I'd invite you to be doing that as well if you're able. If you're not able or you don't want to, there's no pressure to do that. But let's pray together. I'm going to go ahead and get on my knees now.
God, today we want to come before you and pray on behalf of this city that we love. And a city that we know that you love even more. God, would you come and do an amazing work at, in Omaha, Nebraska. And all the cities that are surrounding it. We pray, God, that you would extend mercy and compassion and justice. We pray, God, that there would be good news to people who need good news. We pray that the lonely would be integrated into community and people that would, are hurting would find healing. We pray that people who need to experience love, that your love will be poured out to them. And God, we pray that you would be pleased to use Christ Community Church and our plants and our network and whatever means you see necessary. But God, we pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we want to invite your Holy Spirit and say we'll cooperate with you with whatever you're doing in order to be able to reach this city with the good news. So come Holy Spirit, change us from the inside out and change our city, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, let's jump in and take a look a little bit at what God is doing uh, through David uh, in the story this week. I hope you guys had the opportunity to read the story. And if you know anything about David in the story, David uh, takes up 66 chapters of narrative, and he wrote 100 psalms on top of it. So there's an awful lot of turf we could cover. We can only get two little slices in the two weeks that we're working on. So instead of doing David and Goliath, David running through the caves, David acting like a madman, David at the worst point in his life, I decided today that we would do a passage that is one of the highlight passages in all of the Bible, but is not very famous. It's the passage where God makes a covenant with David. And at this point in the story, David has already become king. He's already run from Saul. Saul is dead. He's already taken over Jerusalem and brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And he's built himself a sweet-looking palace. And so at that moment, he gathers some people together. He talks to his prophet, Nathan, and uh, he says this. This is uh, 2 Samuel 7, page 158 in the story. It says this. After the king was settled in his palace and Yahweh had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying... Now, hold on just a moment here. Because David is sitting in this nice palace. It's made of foreign imported woods, the cedars of Lebanon. And he sees the palace that he's living in, and he goes, Oh my gosh, I noticed that I'm living kind of high on the hog, but the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, is in a tent. In other words, it's in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle had been going around with the Israelites all through the desert. And he says, something's not right here. I shouldn't have a higher status location than the God that I worship. So let's go ahead and uh, build a temple for God. Now, Nathan at first thinks, that sounds all right to me. I mean, every other God has their temple. And so why shouldn't our God have a temple as well? But then some things start churning inside of him. I mean, why would you need a temple? Because God has been content to live in the tabernacle with the Israelites for years and years. Why would he need one? And besides that, God has said that he doesn't actually live in the tent, but that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He's bigger than anything we could ever put him inside. He just doesn't fit in the box. So why would he need a temple? Well, they did eventually build a temple, and it's not so much that the temple was bad... But in this moment, David was missing the point. And so God came to Nathan in the middle of the night, page 159. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, and then this is his message for David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He's the one who will build a house for my holy name, and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. 
Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, these words are some of the most important words that you'll find in the Old Testament, in the whole Bible. They're not that famous, but they should be because they are a covenant with God. Much like God made a covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant, and then he later made a covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. He made a covenant with Moses, the Mosaic covenant. Now he makes a covenant with David, the Davidic covenant. It's all kind of icky, uh, but it's there. Okay, I'm sorry for that one. That was, that was not even that helpful. So uh, he makes this covenant with David, and you'll notice a couple of key aspects to it. One of them is that, David, you are going to have an offspring who will sit on your throne. You'll have someone who will succeed you. It's not going to be like Saul, but you'll have someone who will succeed you, and he's going to be the one who builds my house. You're not going to build the house. He will. And the way that that was fulfilled was in the next king, David's son Solomon. David collected all of the resources for the temple. He invited all the giving for the temple, but it was actually Solomon who built the temple. But did you notice that his promise expands from a next generation perspective to a much broader perspective? In fact, an eternal perspective. Because he says, my love will never be taken from him. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever. Now we know that this temple that was built by Solomon only lasted for about 400 years before it was destroyed. It didn't last forever, but God said there will be a king, one of your descendants, and there will be a kingdom that will last forever and ever. The other thing that God's doing in this moment is he's turning the tables on David. Because David says, I'm going to build your house, God. And then God says, no, 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 David, I'm going to build your house. And it'll be a house that lasts forever and ever. And as the story unfolds, you find out that David's house is God's house. It is God's kingdom. And that the fulfillment is not just for David's legacy, but it's for God's plans for all of humanity. Because a thousand years later, someone would come on the scene who would be called the son of David. And just like David was born in Bethlehem, so he would be born in Bethlehem. And just like David killed the biggest enemy of Israel, Goliath, so this uh, uh, descendant of David would kill the biggest enemy of humanity, death and sin. Jesus would come onto the scene and he would begin preaching the good news and healing every sickness everywhere that he went and he would establish his kingdom, the kingdom of God. And as he would go around to each of the disciples, he would invite them to come in and say, I want you to come and be a part of my kingdom. Give up your lesser pursuits, give up your small dreams, give up your small desires, and trust me with everything you have, 100% surrender. Or as Jesus said, come and die, come and die in order to be a part of my family. And when you give yourself fully to me, I will unleash in you a life that you would have never thought possible. And he did that, and it mattered. And this is the kind of kingdom that we want, and this is the kind of surrender that Jesus calls us to. Because 100% surrender was not just for the first generation disciples. 100% surrender is for you and for me as well. And God goes ahead and he builds his house through David's descendants. It reminds me, this idea of being all in and what God is going to do in our midst, it reminds me of what Jesus said when he was talking to his disciples. Took them to an off-site retreat one day, and one of the comments that he made to Peter is he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now you notice this small note, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You ever notice that gates are not an offensive weapon? Right? Right? Come on, man, I'll get you. I'll kill you with my gate. I'm going to take you out. No, the gates of hell not prevailing has the assumption that the people of God are storming the gates of hell and God is going to win because the gates of hell will not prevail against God's kingdom. And it's not even us who do it. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is good news, amen? We are on the winning team together. God's calling us to this. Now, in this month, I've been challenging you to begin thinking about your financial commitment to the kingdom of God. 
And you've been awesome to be able to take a deeper look at anticipating the commitment as you get to a position of 100% surrender before God. And you know that next week, November 4th, we're going to be receiving that commitment, kind of a refreshed commitment for our Beyond Belief campaign that will be looking forward to the next 12 months of what is God doing in our midst and how are we financially committed to that. And our goal for this campaign is not primarily a financial goal. Our number one goal for the campaign is an engagement goal. 100% engagement. That all of us would surrender before God and whatever God tells us to do, that's what we would go ahead and commit. And the challenge is a challenge that's an internal challenge. It's a a generosity challenge. It's a disciple-making challenge. Because one of the key characteristics God wants to develop inside of us is the characteristic of generosity. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity we have for this. So what I want to do is I want to offer up a little challenge, a generosity challenge. And it's different than what happens in a a lot of churches or a lot of campaigns because I'm not going to measure it in terms of dollars or percents of giving. I think oftentimes that can leave us feeling guilty or a little bit lifeless, but instead about what God cares about more, and that is the attitude of the heart. Just as David was known as a man after God's own heart, so we would be known as people who share God's heart of generosity. So for the balance of the message, I'm going to take you through five different levels of generosity, five different types of givers that there are, but not measured by how many dollars or percents you give, measured by what's happening in your internal world. Now, some of you who have been here for a year might say, hey, that sounds familiar. Didn't you do something like that last year in a message? And the answer is, yes, I did. I did. If you weren't here last year, I want you to think about these five, level, or these five levels of givers on two different planes. One of the planes to think about is, well, what level am I at right now? And the next one is, what level do I want to be at? For those of you who may have heard this uh, section of a message before, I want you to think about it on three levels. One is, what level was I at last year? What level am I at now? And what level do I think God is calling me to? So it's a little bit of a self-exam. Are you guys ready for this? Okay, group dismissed. Let's just, okay. Are you guys ready for this? All right, here we go. Here we go. Level number one. Level number one is an initial giver. I don't know if you know this, but statistically nationwide, 40% of regular church attenders put nothing in the offering plate. But for many people, there comes that moment, that first moment where they say, oh man, I really want to participate in this. It's maybe a vision was cast or a point of need was shown that helps draw them in. And uh, they say, I'm going to give for my very first time. And the people who are initial givers realize what Jesus said. It's more blessed to give than receive really is true. And they begin to own that for themselves for the very first time. And if you're somebody who's saying, I want to get in on the very first level, I want to say, welcome to the team. I'm cheering you on as you go about doing that. Second level is a consistent giver, a consistent giver. And a consistent giver is somebody who says, I'm not just going to give one time or once in a while or whenever there's a need. Instead, I'm going to begin giving on a regular basis, consistently, every single week. Oftentimes, people figure they're giving as a percent of their income. They might bring a check to church every week. They might be giving online. But they say, every single week, I'm going to be somebody who is uh, a giver. They see that giving is not just something that is an occasional event, but it's a reflection of their worship of God. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 9. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, For God loves a cheerful giver. So decide in your heart what to give in advance and then go ahead and give that regularly. That's what typifies a uh, consistent giver. I know for Kelly and I, our first eight years of ministry, I would have typified us as consistent givers. We were living at or below the poverty level uh, during that time in ministry. And what we found is that as we gave cheerfully to God, not under compulsion, that God took care of us every moment. There wasn't a day that we didn't have a roof over our head or food on the table or friends for the journey or laughter along the way. God provided for us abundantly in each of those moments. Next level up from consistent giver is somebody who is an intentional giver. An intentional giver. 
Now, an intentional giver is a person who starts to think about their giving in terms of what they spend their money on and compare that to how much they give to God. And they think of themselves, they go, okay, why is it that I spend more money on my cell phone than I give to God in a given week? Why is it that I'm spending more on my car payment than I am giving to God? So how about you? If you're going to put your giving on a spreadsheet and say, here's, I mean, all my spending on a spreadsheet and say, here's my top amount and then all the way down to my bottom amount, where would your giving to God land? Would you say, I give more than I spend at restaurants, more than my last vacation? And how does that reflect in your worship priorities? I remember my son Caleb, who I'd consider to be an intentional giver, at age 16. I was looking through our bank statements, and I found out that in his account, it had drained $1,400 from his bank account in a single week. So I went to go and have the awkward dad conversation with my 16-year-old. Because I'm thinking like, you know, drug addiction, internet poker, something like this. And so I go and start talking to him. I say, Caleb, you know, uh, I noticed that there's $1,400 missing from your bank account. Can you tell me what happened with that? He says, oh, yeah, Dad. I went to the bank, and uh, I took it all out in cash, and I threw it in the offering plate. (laughs) And uh, I said, wow, that's interesting. Like, my dad bone and my pastor bone kicked in at the same time, and I was proud and mad all at the same time. And I said, can you tell me a little bit about that? And he said, yeah, you know, I was thinking about trusting God. And all my life, you've provided everything I've ever needed. God's provided everything we've ever needed as a family. And uh, I've never had to trust God in my whole life. The first thing I really have to trust God for is my college education. So I decided as an act of faith, I'd put that 1400 in the offering plate. Now, I am not recommending this for everybody. But for him at the time, it was what God was leading him to do. And I said, okay, son, uh, uh, great, that's awesome. And uh, I was grateful for the way he was very intentional about his giving and his desire to trust in God more deeply. Well, Caleb's 24 years old now. He's already through all of his college. And in his church in Lexington, Kentucky, he's one of the key financial consultants for his church, helping people in his church to be able to manage their money well. He's still intentional about what he's doing. I'm so proud of him for that. I'll also let you know that he's now through college, which, as you know, is expensive, and he's married uh, now, and some wives are more expensive than college, and uh, they just bought themselves a little house, and with the exception of the mortgage that they have on their house, they're debt-free. And God has provided for him every single step of the way as he's trusted God and managed his resources well. Well, that's level three, the intentional giver. Uh, Level four, a surrendered giver takes that to the next level. And a surrendered giver doesn't say, how does my giving compare to my spending? A surrendered giver says, how does my giving compare to what Jesus did on the cross to die for me? They go, if Jesus gave 100% for me, how do I live my life with 100% surrender and reckless abandon towards him and what he's doing in my life right now? They don't ask, how much do I give towards God? They ask, am I holding anything back from God and why? And the surrendered giver's verse is from Colossians. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things hold together and he's the head of the body, the church. A surrendered giver gives out of the lordship of Jesus being very first and foremost in their life. Last year at Advanced Commitment Night, uh, I noticed two people sitting on either side of Kelly and I. One of them was somebody who was a, a businessman who did really well. He was there with a big smile on his face, and I knew that he was bringing a big check. I don't see the numbers, so I don't know how much people give, but based on prior conversations, I guessed that it was somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, I was, you know, proud to see him there, proud to see the smile on his face, and on the other side of Kelly and I was a single mom, (laughs) and uh, she was coming, bringing her commitment with a similar smile on her face. And I don't know how much money she gave, but I know enough about her financial situation to know that whatever the dollar amount was, it was a lot. Because it was a lot for her. And I think of both of these people at different ends of the economic spectrum who were surrendered givers and were fully pleasing to God for the gifts that they brought to him. 
And God loves people who are fully surrendered to him. Now you may say, how can you get a level higher than a surrendered giver? What does level five look like? It is a lifetime giver. A lifetime giver. One of the things that's commanded in the Bible in 1 Timothy 6 is, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Put your hope fully in God. Now, a lifetime giver asks, what are the long-term effects of my generosity? And they plan their giving for a lifetime and plan their life around their giving. I got to meet one couple at Christ Community Church who would be a modest income couple. But there's somebody who said, over the course of our lifetime, we made a deal when we first got married that over the course of our lifetime, we want to give a million dollars to our church and to missions. And they started doing that when they were young. And you would never guess who this couple is. You'd you'd never know it by meeting them because they drive ordinary cars until they drive them all the way into the ground. And they live in a pretty ordinary house and they do all of their fix-it stuff all by themselves so that they can designate as much finances as possible for the thing that matters to them the most and that is the kingdom of God. And they're about 30 years into this process and they are almost to their million dollar mark. And I'm just so proud of them. They're an example of a lifetime giver. And I've been praying that God will raise up a new generation of lifetime givers here at Christ Community Church. Amen? So, do your self-evaluation. Where were you at last year at this point? Where are you at now? And where are you heading in your commitment level? The next week, I think, is an important week for us to go to prayer to God and say, God, what do you want to do in me? What do you want to do through me as it relates to this campaign? To make your decision and to come next week ready to go. You'll have a card that hopefully you got on the way in, but if you didn't, you can get it on the way out that has a couple of different options. And in our services, one of the options will be, I'd like to make a 12-month commitment to Beyond Belief in the amount of. Now, this is for people who are new to Beyond Belief. If you're someone who's new to Christ Community Church or you didn't have a chance to give last year for one reason or another, you can get in the game now. Make a 12-month commitment and you will be welcomed into the team. That'll be an exciting thing. Or maybe you're somebody who gave last year. You're already committed to Beyond Belief. And you say, hey, here's my commitment. Now, on this card, you just fill out, this was the commitment that I made last year. And if for some reason you don't remember that, you can call our offices. Our accounting people can let you know and how you're doing on that commitment. And then ask the question, God, is that what you still want me to do? And if that's yes, that's what God still wants you to do, boom, check this box and finish strong. But God may be inviting some people To say, you know what, my faith has grown in the last year. Or my resources have grown in the last year. And maybe God's inviting you to an increased commitment for this because he's challenging you to that. And if that's the case, then just go ahead and fill in this line with what your new two-year commitment is. And it'll be between you and God, and God will celebrate that together. Now we're doing this, friends, because we believe that the good news of Jesus is the best news ever. And I still believe that you can change the world from Omaha, Nebraska. I still believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I still believe that there are a half million people in Omaha who the best thing that can happen for them is that they would receive the life and love of Jesus. Amen? I still believe that we need to take the best news ever to the least reached people. And I still believe that God uses flawed people like you and like me to accomplish his purposes in our generation. And he's going to continue to do that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, let's stand together and just invite God's power and presence to be at work among us and for him to do the work that he needs to do in order to reach a city in a way that's beyond belief. God, thanks that you've given us such a great mission and such a great task. Thank you that you live inside of us and you are empowering us to live lives that are beyond belief and you're inviting us into a life that flows through Jesus. God, I pray that you'll help us to excel in our faith, to excel in our understanding of you, and to excel in our generosity. Because we know, God, you are a generous God and we're most like you when we're being generous. So we pray for your goodness to be poured out in us and through us and for you to accomplish your will 
here on this earth. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you all.